Welcome to Mikon's Hardware. In this video, I'm going to talk about Intel Xeon E5 2698v3. This is one of the most powerful Xeon CPUs for the LJ2011 version 3 platform. Of course, there are a few other Xeon E5 v4 and v3 CPUs which are even more powerful, but at the moment, this is one of the most powerful CPUs which you can buy for a reasonable amount of money. First of all, I would like to express my appreciation to the subscriber who has donated me this CPU for this video and this review. Thank you very much. It not only helps me to upkeep my YouTube channel financially, but it also brings me extra motivation to keep working on this video because I understand that people like them and appreciate them. And honestly, I should have done this review long time ago, uh, maybe even like a month or two months ago, but I didn't really have a chance to make enough dedicated video for this CPU to test with and without hyperthreading and to figure out the best undervolting settings for this CPU. I also wanted to have fresh data from my Ryzen 5 5600X, that's why this video took so long to complete. Since I have received the CPU for almost no money, I plan to use it in my personal workstation. I would feel really bad to sell it in one of my builds for my customers or for my friends. Thus, I will see in reality how the CPU performs for my work tasks and for gaming. Right now I'm using Xeon E5 2690v3, but I will upgrade to E5 2698v3. So, let's talk about the CPU itself. Xeon E5 2698v3 has 16 cores, 32 threads. CPU frequency goes from 2.3 to 3.6 GHz. With the Turbo Boost Unlock, we may try to force all CPU cores to work at the maximum CPU clock frequency, but of course there is a TDP limit. This TDP limit for E5 2698v3 is 135 watts. Due to this limitation, the CPU will be downclocking itself even with Turbo Boost Unlock. That is why it is important to see how the CPU is going to behave with and without hyperthreading enabled. It's also interesting to see what kind of undervolting levels will be achievable with and without hyperthreading. To make this video more informative and more interesting, I of course add my Ryzen 5 5600X results. And for this video, I have redone all my Ryzen 5 tests using the latest Windows and the latest games installations with all the drivers and updates installed. As usual, all technical specification and all detailed test results you will be able to find in my technical slides by the end of the video, but I still need to mention a few interesting things. First of all, for the test results I was using my Huanan X99 TF motherboard with the Xeon E5 2698v3. And this time I have used a different BIOS option. Instead of using the previous FFS Turbo Boost unlocking method, this time I'm using S3 Turbo 2 method to unlock Turbo Boost. This is slightly different because it makes a BIOS PEI module, which is injected into different region of the BIOS, and that region is executed when you're resuming your computer from the sleep mode. In the past, using FFS driver injected into the BIOS, we are getting Turbo Boost Unlock, but the Turbo Boost Unlock was either lost once you resume your computer from the sleep mode, or the computer was not working with the sleep mode at all. With this new method, sleep mode is working fine. An additional benefit from the new method is that the CPU is consuming less power at the idle state. I have updated Mi 899 with the new BIOS modifications, including minus 100 mV offset for the CPU, so for those who were seeking for it, it's now available in Mi 899. Let's go back to the TDP limit of the CPU. Nobody knows how Intel TDP limitation is calculated and implemented. What I can say for sure is that hardware monitor is not representing the immediately correct values according to the Intel TDP calculations. If you run hardware monitor and HWinfo or something like that and then stress test your CPU with ADA64 for example, you will see that the CPU is not reaching the 135 TDP limit but the CPU clock frequency is still decreasing from 3.6 GHz. This is a little bit frustrating and you might think that there are some other limitations, but in reality there are no other limitations, it's just the TDP limit. Intel TDP is not calculated as a momentarily instant value, it's calculated over the time. If you keep running the stress test for a little longer, you will see that the value of the power consumption of your CPU is slowly stabilizing and staying at 135 watts. That is why the limit of the CPU clock frequency with the Turbo Boost unlocked is exactly the TDP. I have tried to reduce the CPU voltage and every time I go down by 5 or 10 millivolts, 
CPU clock frequency is increasing by a little bit. People are constantly asking me about the hack which allows to bypass this TDP limitation. S3 Turbo 2 has a feature which allows you to remove or disable the CPU power consumption limitation. In reality, this hack doesn't really work as we would wish for. If I enable this hack, the CPU starts to drink electricity like a beer and doesn't care about anything, but the CPU clocks are still not going up to 3.6 GHz. CPU is overheating, consuming shitloads of power, VRM is overheating, but the target clock frequency is still not reached. That is why I strongly do not recommend to use this hack, and I'm not going to include such biases into Mi 899 application. If you would like to fry off your motherboard, then go ahead, implement this bias yourself and use it yourself. Okay, so my particular Xeon EFI 2698V3 is able to work stable with minus 90, minus 50 millivolts offset for a CPU cores and CPU cache or a CPU integrated memory controller IMC. If I keep reducing the CPU voltage, the system kind of works, but if I try to use the system like in a normal use, for example, uh, running some games or running some long running tasks such as a video rendering or something like that, every now and then the system would crash, the game would crash, or I would receive some weird messages from Windows, something like there is not enough memory or similar to that. Still, if I disable hyperthreading, I'm able to further reduce the voltage and go to minus 100, minus 60 millivolts. But this was the furthest I could push the CPU while staying stable. In this video, I'm going to perform multiple different workstation benchmarks as well as test 18 different games. In the video, I'm not going to talk about every game, but every game was tested 3 times, 1080p, 1440p, and 4K or 2160p. If you're interested in the detailed results, go to the end of the video and watch the slides. Instead, in the video, I'm going to show side-by-side -side comparison between Ryzen 5 5600X, EFI 2698V3 with and without hyper-threading. So you will see with your own eyes FPS, minimal FPS, maximum FPS, and gameplay in those picked games that I find the most interesting to talk about. Let's start with the Cinebench. Using single core, we see that Ryzen 5 5600X is almost twice as fast as a Xeon EFI 2698V3. Cinebench R15 gives the following scores, 136 for Xeon, 254 for Ryzen. Cinebench R20 gives 323 points for Xeon and 600 points for Ryzen. Cinebench R23 gives 822 points for Xeon and 1541 points for Ryzen. Using all CPU cores, we see that the Xeon E5 with hyperthreading is able to beat Ryzen 5, but if we disable hyperthreading, this 16 cores is not enough to beat Ryzen 5 with just 6 cores. In general, the performance between all three configurations is very similar. Xeon E5 with hyperthreading takes the first place, Ryzen 5 takes the second place, and Xeon E5 without hyperthreading stays on the last place. Geekbench 5 and CPU Z using single core. Basically the same picture as Cinebench. Ryzen 5 5600X is twice as fast as a Xeon E5 2698V3. CPU Z gives 400 points to Xeon E5 and 650 points to Ryzen 5. Geekbench 5 gives 850 points for Xeon and 1600 points for Ryzen. But this time enabling all CPU cores gives a Xeon E5 a slight advantage. Here it was about 20-40% faster when using all CPU cores and all CPU threads, but only 15% faster if we disable hyperthreading and have 16 cores and 16 threads. Blender and Corona benchmark. These values demonstrate time, so less is better. With hyperthreading enabled, Xeon E5 2698V3 is able to beat Ryzen 5 by 15-25%. to But if we disable hyperthreading, Ryzen 5 5600X and Xeon E5 2698 are basically providing the same performance. DaVinci Resolve and VRA GPU benchmark. To test DaVinci Resolve, I'm using Puget System DaVinci Resolve benchmark, which is testing 4K and 1080p performance. At 4K, all three configurations are providing very similar results, but E5 2698 with hyperthreading enabled gives the best result. 79 points compared to 67 and 64 points, for Ryzen 5 and Xeon E5 without hyperthreading. Interestingly enough, for 1080p video production, Ryzen 5 5600X is significantly better. Here it scores 123 points compared to 78 and 72 points for Xeon E5. 
VRA GPU benchmark relies mostly on the GPU performance, but it is also important to have a fast CPU. Here, Ryzen 5 5600X is not able to match Xeon E5 2698P3 with hyperthreading enabled, but disabling hyperthreading gives basically identical performance between 2698P3 and Ryzen 5 5600X. 7-zip compression and decompression, as well as VRA CPU benchmark. All three configurations are very similar. Still, Xeon E5 2698P3, with hyperthreading enabled, is able to deliver the best performance. Handbrake. Here I have two tests. In the first test, I am converting 1080p TS video, which was captured by my video capture card, into MP4. In this case, Handbrake is able to use all possible CPU resource, so every CPU core is utilized. Ryzen 5 5600X and Xeon E5 2698V3, with and without hyperthreading, are delivering basically identical performance. In the other test, I'm converting a 4K video produced by DaVinci Resolve in MP4 1440p to upload to YouTube. In this case, Handbrake is not able to efficiently utilize every CPU core. Ryzen 5 5600X completes the test in about 28 minutes. Xeon E5 2698V3 takes about 43 minutes. Disabling hyperthreading with E5 2698V3 improves results to about 35 minutes, but still the difference between Ryzen and Xeon is significant. As you can see, even a 16-core Xeon E5 is not able to significantly beat 6-core Ryzen 5 5600X. The performance between these two CPUs is basically identical, especially if we disable hyperthreading. With hyperthreading enabled, Xeon E5 was mostly faster, like 10 to 15 or maybe up to 25% faster than 6-core Ryzen 5, but it's still very impressive by Ryzen 5, which has only 6 cores, to compete with the 16-core Xeon E5 2698v3. In general, for productivity tasks, it does not make any sense to disable hyperthreading, but most of the people who are buying budget X99 computers are playing games and not just doing working tasks. That's why now let's take a look at some games and see how Xeon E5 2698 is going to compare against Ryzen 5 5600X in games with and without hyperthreading. The first game will be Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It is interesting to take a look at this game because I am also going to show results for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And those two games are developed by the same studio, but first one is older and using DirectX 11, while the other one is a newer and using DirectX 12 API. Thus, it will be possible to see how the games develop over the time and see the progress of the optimization. So, Assassin's Creed Odyssey DirectX 11 at 1080p, Xeon E5 2698v3, is about 30% slower than Ryzen 5 5600X. Ryzen 5 is able to deliver 37 and 81 FPS by minimal and average metrics. Xeon E5 is only able to deliver 27 and 60 FPS. The difference is rather significant, and even though you don't see it, I can tell that at 1440p and even at 4K, Xeon E5 is still significantly slower than Ryzen 5. But if we switch to Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which is using DirectX 12 API, we see a completely different picture. Here, Xeon E5 and Ryzen 5 are delivering identical performance even at 1080p. Ryzen 5 5600X is able to render 81 FPS by 1% low and 116 FPS on average. Xeon E5 2698 is able to render 74 FPS 1% low, which is slightly lower than 81 FPS from Ryzen, but 119 FPS on average, which is slightly higher than Ryzen 5 5600X. It is very nice to see that the modern games are starting to properly utilize more CPU cores and starting to do some useful work of those idling cores. Still, as you will soon realize, not all of the modern games are actually able to do something useful with those idling CPU cores. The next tested game is F1 2019. Even though the game uses DirectX 12 API, it is still really, really limited by single-core performance, memory latency, and memory speed. Here, at 1080p, Xeon E5 was 25-30% to slower when compared to Ryzen 5 5600X. Ryzen 5 delivers 206 and 300 FPS, minimal and average, while Xeon E5 is giving you only 149 and 222 FPS. It is not a bad value by no means, but still, the difference is rather significant between these two CPUs. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is another game which is well optimized to use multiple CPU cores. 
This game is very often brought up to demonstrate that Xeon CPUs can stand against modern Ryzen and Intel Core CPUs. Still, even though the game is really optimized and it is able to load multiple CPU cores, here 6-core Ryzen is much, much better than Xeon E5. At 1080p, Ryzen 5 delivers 121 FPS by minimal and 178 FPS by average. Xeon E5 is only able to deliver 73 minimal FPS and 123 average FPS. Disabling hyperthreading gives slightly better results, 76 minimal and 131 averages. Thus we can see that the Xeon E5 averages are only able to match Ryzen 5 minimal FPS. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Age is another game which is heavily dependent on the single-core performance. Still, even with the Xeon E5 2698v3, the game is able to render minimum 290 FPS at 1080p. Average value stays at 350. Disabling hyperthreading increases the values to 340 and 417 FPS. Ryzen 5 is able to significantly beat these values, 421 FPS minimum, and 576 FPS on average. Once again, we see that the best Xeon can do is match Ryzen minimal values with the Xeon average values. Even though the difference between the CPUs goes as high as 40%, I still think that this is a rather good result for Xeon E5. 290 minimal FPS is more than enough even for the most demanding gamer. And the last two games I would like to take a look at is Call of Duty Modern Warfare and Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. I personally find these two games interested to investigate because I play both of them, because both of the games are coming from the same company and they are kind of from the same franchise. Modern Warfare is known to be able to utilize as many CPU cores as available, but what I have found is that the game is not actually using the CPU cores to do something useful. In my previous video where I have tested Core i3-10100F, someone suggested to me that Call of Duty Modern Warfare has a hidden setting to modify how many simultaneous gaming threads or gaming processes will be running on the system. This value can be adjusted to increase and decrease CPU load. If I keep the value at 16, which is default for E5 2698v3, and keep hyperthreading enabled, the gaming performance is rather pathetic. The game is able to load every CPU core, but the performance is really bad. It seems like one CPU core is used to provide load for the second CPU core, but both of the cores are not doing anything useful. In this configuration, the performance stays at 105 and 167 FPS. If I limit the number of game renderers to 10 and disable CPU hyperthreading, then I get a much better performance. 146 FPS minimum and 215 FPS on average. This is not far from 162 FPS on minimum and 227 FPS on average from Ryzen. Thus, we can see that even though Call of Duty Modern Warfare is able to kinda load all CPU cores, it's not actually doing anything useful with these cores, and it is important to adjust the game settings so it's not doing work just for the sake of doing the work. And the last game, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. Here we see that the Xeon E5 2698v3, with and without hyperthreading, is significantly behind Ryzen 5 5600X. At 1080p, Ryzen 5 is delivering 134 and 201 FPS, minimal and average, while Xeon E5 is only able to give 106 and 133 FPS. Disabling hyperthreading doesn't really help here. Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War is a perfect demonstration that not every modern game will be optimized and will be developed with multi-core CPU in mind. It is much cheaper to develop a game which will be using up to 4-6 CPU cores and many game developers will keep doing this. Again, if you're interested to see results of every other game, just go to the end of the video and check out my slides. But now let's take a look at average of 18 games combined together. At 1080p, Ryzen 5 5600X delivers 120 and 182 FPS, minimal and average. Xeon E5 2698 with hyperthreading enabled gives 84 and 132 FPS. Xeon E5 2698v3 with a disabled hyperthreading gives 90 and 147 FPS. Thus, we can see that disabling hyperthreading and further reducing CPU voltage gives a significant punch to the CPU in terms of gaming performance. Still, it is far from enough to be able to compete or beat Ryzen 5 5600X. Even at 1440p, Xeon E5 2698v3 is still up to 21% slower than Ryzen 5 5600X. 
and only if we switch to 4K or 2160p we will see a negligible difference between these two CPUs. Ryzen 5 5600X was on average 5 to 10 percent faster than Xeon E5 2698V3. Of course, CPU performance is only one side of the coin, so let's take a look at the CPU power consumption. If you would like to see detailed results of my tests, go to the end of the video and check out my slides. Here I demonstrate average power consumption by entire system at idle, working benchmarks and gaming. At idle, entire system with Ryzen 5 5600X consumes around 50 watt electricity. Xeon E5 system consumes slightly more with 58 watt. Using Blender or Cinebench R23 benchmarks, Ryzen 5 5600X consumes only 138 watt. Xeon E5 2698V3 with enabled hyperthreading is getting up to 223 watt. Disabling hyperthreading slightly reduces power consumption, and the system consumes 203 watt. As you can see, the power consumption difference is rather significant, but how significant it is for you, you shall decide it yourself. Under gaming conditions, the most power hungry component is the graphics card, thus the power consumption difference is not that big. Testing Assassin's Creed Valhalla and F1 2019, entire system with Ryzen 5 consumes around 380 watt. If we switch to Xeon E5 2698V3 system, the power consumption goes up to 352 watt. So the difference between the two systems under gaming conditions is around 45 watt. Again, it's not that dramatic, but it is significant. How significant it is for you, it is up to you to decide. With all these results on hand, so we can safely say that Ryzen 5 5600X is a beast. 6 cores, 12 threads is able to compete with the 16 core, 32 threads Xeon E5, even if Xeon E5 is turbo boost unlocked. Of course, Ryzen 5 5600X is a much newer CPU, and the price for this CPU right now is about 350 euros. For this money you can buy Xeon E5 2698V3, X99 motherboard and probably you can squeeze in memory. Of course you are getting slightly aged or slightly outdated or really outdated X99 platform, it depends how you look at it, and you will get higher electricity or power consumption, but how it is important for you or not important for you, this is up to you to decide. The price difference between Xeon E5 2698V3 and Ryzen 5 5600X is rather significant. Right now on AliExpress, Xeon E5 2698V3 can be bought for around 170 euros. And I would say that I really like this CPU, it performs really well and it gives a step up uh, from Xeon E5 2678V3 and Xeon E5 2690V3. Still, I do not recommend to buy this CPU, and this is because you can buy Xeon E5 2697V3. 2697V3 is right now available on AliExpress for around 120 to 130 euros. It has 14 cores, 28 threads, so the core number is very similar to E5 2698V3, and it has also 3.6 GHz turbo frequency. What's more important, this CPU has 145 watt TDP limitation, so those 14 cores will be able to clock higher than Xeon E5 2698V3. And the price difference is also rather significant, 125 euros compared to 170 euros, and you're getting an extra cash to be able to buy a better graphics card, extra memory or an SSD drive. If you're interested, I will try to buy myself Xeon E5 2697V3 and make some detailed testing of that CPU. For now, I plan to revisit Intel Core i9-10900 engineering sample QTP2 to be able to see how that CPU compares against Ryzen 5 5600X and Xeon E5, especially because the CPU price has dropped since the last time I have checked the CPU. I'm also looking at Xeon E5 2689V4. This CPU is still costing around 250 euros, which is insane, and you shall not buy it for this money. But this CPU could be interested for those who do not want to bother with a turbo boost unlock and don't want to do any hacks like that, they just want to plug in the CPU, get 10 fast cores and have memory running at DDR4-2400. For gaming that might be a good CPU, but as I said, the price of 250 euros is kinda insane at the moment. If the CPU goes down in price, I will try to get it for a review and tell you how it goes and compares to other alternatives. For now though, that's all I have for you, thanks for watching, thanks for listening, I hope you have enjoyed it, I hope it's gonna be useful, goodbye.